What's going on, Arc Junkies? Welcome to show number 223. Man, I have had one hell of a month. As many of you may know, April is National Welding Month and probably one of my busiest months of the year for obvious reasons. I was able to make it out to two welding competitions, one out here in Tampa for the Smoke and Sparks Welding Competition hosted by the West Coast section of the American Welding Society. And then on April 22nd, I was up in Kentucky for the Kentucky Welding Institute competition. And that was a blast. They had over 120 students uh, compete in this event. There was, uh, I think, people from 18 different states. They had all kinds of crazy prizes to give away. I got to meet people from all around the U.S., got to hang out with some of my friends, grab some drinks, got to dinner. I even got to hang out with Jimmy McKnight, the original host of the Arc Junkies podcast. We actually went for a, uh, a tour of the Buffalo Trace Distillery that Sunday. And then right after that, we went to the uh, Castle and Key Distillery. Both tours were amazing. I highly recommend if you get up to Kentucky, go ahead and check those tours out. It's really interesting to see how they make bourbon. Uh, but all in all, it was great catching up with Jimmy and just seeing what he's been up to. Um, he's in a new band. So make sure to give that a follow on Instagram. It's called I Am Genocide. I even got some time to relax, which was definitely needed. I've been pushing myself pretty hard lately, as many of you could probably tell from my episode that I did with Dusty a couple weeks ago. So it was nice to get away, you know, relax a little bit, catch up with old friends, meet some new people, and just, you know, kind of leave everything behind. It was, uh, it, it was, it was nice. It was definitely needed. But now I'm back at it. Yesterday I got the, uh, the new studio completely insulated, and then hopefully by next weekend, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put up the drywall, hopefully get the painting done. We'll see how far I can get with that, though. Uh, I at least want to get the drywall done at a minimum. After that, it's carpet, and then I can start moving in. I'm super stoked about seeing the, this goal finally come to an end and taking the show to the next level. And I can't wait to see what the future holds for the Arc Junkies podcast. Speaking of the show, as many of you know, the mission of the Arc Junkies podcast is to help educate and inspire the next generation of welders. I always try to do my best to stay on track with that mission. Each week, I put out regular episodes of the Arc Junkies podcast and just the Tip Tuesday episodes that align with that mission. And I try to put out as much information as possible to educate the listeners by discussing technical information, talking about the mistakes that I've made on my welding journey or the mistakes the guests on the show have made so that you, the listeners, can actually you know avoid these mistakes and, and possibly fast track your journey and avoid certain pitfalls. I also try to highlight the successes as well to inspire new welders or give different perspective to those that have been in the welding industry for a while. I do my best to help the listeners of the show, and that can look a little different for everyone who's listening. Whether it's a tip for working on your equipment at the house, or a new tool or piece of gear to make your life a little bit easier and more efficient, or maybe it's some useful information on setting up your own business so you can strike out on your own. I try to cover a little bit of everything so I can help out as many listeners as possible. Well, in today's episode, I'm at it again. Today, I'm chatting with Jeff Loach and Kyle Kogelman of AC Equipment Services. In this episode, we hit all three boxes that support the mission of the Arc Junkies podcast. We discuss an area of the industry that I wasn't even familiar with that should inspire and educate some of you to seek out a new career in the welding industry and then help you by providing the opportunity to hire on with a company that has longevity and a very competitive compensation package for doing what sounds like a really fun job. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to these two and the type of work that they do and the opportunity they're offering right now for new hires. We'll get right into it right after a quick word from the supporters of the show. Today's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Rock Mount Research and Alloys. I'm sure you've heard all about their great rods and wires and perhaps heard the episode with Pat Adams I did a while back. Rock Mount is growing, and right now, they're looking for new reps all across the country. If you're interested in building a career helping maintenance welders solve problems with the best materials around, then reach out to at Rock Mount Welding on Instagram or via their website contact form. Get first-rate technical training and sell the Rolls-Royce of welding rods with Rock Mount Research and Alloys. For more information on this great opportunity, you can send an email to my buddy Mark Wilson, wilsonm at rockmountwelding.com, and tell him Jason from the Arc Junkies podcast sent you. We're also brought to you by Fronius USA. Fronius is the innovation leader in arc welding. Their attention to arc precision and energy management has created some of the best arc welders and welding processes on the market. From cold metal transfer to the first battery-powered welder, Fronius continues to push the limits of welding technology. This year, Fronius is releasing the new multi-process iWave. This machine offers full MIG, MAG, TIG, and stick capabilities, allowing users to experience maximum flexibility and upgradability. Fronius, now a global company, started a family-owned business over 75 years ago. This year marks the 20th anniversary of Fronius USA. 
Celebrations and giveaways are going to be announced. Watch the Fronius USA Facebook and Instagram pages for your chance to participate. Fronius USA is excited to share its new promotion with listeners of the Arc Junkies podcast. Starting April 15th through June 30th, you can order a Transsteel 2200 Compact and get a second MIG torch set up absolutely free. It's a $500 value. The Transsteel 2200 is a compact 3-in-1 solution for MIG, MAG, TIG, and stick welding. The 2200 is easy to use, reliable, and has the intelligent Fronius Arc. Set up your free torch for a quick changeover or keep it as a spare. The choice is yours. This promotion is only valid in the USA. We're also brought to you by Lincoln Electric, the welding experts. I recently had a couple people reach out to me on Instagram about a PAPR system. I personally own the 3250D FGS and use it for all the times that I have to weld galvanized, stainless, and aluminum, and sometimes use it for flux cord welding as well. The best part about this hood is the flip-up front screen, so you can use it as a grinding shield as well. I hate grinding with the grind option on a welding hood. I just like a bigger, clear window when I'm grinding. But the FGS hood is two systems in one. The 3250D FGS allows you to do both while still keeping the fumes out of your hood. In addition, the 3350D FGS has the awesome 4C lens technology that eliminates imperfections and color saturation to create clearer views of the base metal, arc, and weld puddle. If you don't have at-the-source fume extraction or mechanical fume mitigation, the PAPR system is the best means of protection against welding fume and particulate matter for welding, cutting, and grinding. You can pick up your PAPR system today and save 20% when you go to store.lincolnelectric.com and use Arc Junkies 20 at checkout. You can also save 20% on all consumables, gear, and accessories. But the savings don't stop there. You can save 10% on all equipment when you use Arc Junkies 10 at checkout. Lincoln Electric, the welding experts. All right, you know what time it is. Fire up your machines, drop your hood, and turn me up five. This is Ray Ripple, and you're listening to Arc Donkey's Podcast. You're listening to the Arc Junkies Podcast. Helping you make every weld better than your last with each episode. And now your host, Jason Becker. All right, joining me this evening is Jeff and Kyle from AC Equipment Services, which is a division of ThyssenKrupp. Guys, thanks for joining me. Well, oh, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Jeff, tell me a little bit about what you do with AC Equipment Services and how you got into it, and a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, I have been with AC Equipment for 22 years now. So I started with the company as a field service advisor right out of college. I have a degree in mechanical engineering. And so I spent the first five years of my career analyzing the equipment in operation and helping customers optimize the performance of it by measuring the center line alignment and adjusting the equipment. Part of that service involves looking for capital repair projects that the customer will need to make in the future years. So while we're doing that analyzation or alignment, we go ahead and inspect the equipment for them and help our other, com- other groups in our company uh, find additional work for their outage and shutdown seasons. So I I did that for many years, and then I was the buyer for about 12 years. Uh, I was the manager of parts and service for several years, and now I'm the director of field service activities. And then what type of equipment specifically were you kind of looking on and and checking all the center lines and everything for? So AC equipment only works on rotary kilns, and our primary customers are cement plants, paper mills, uh, and aggregate materials material processing facilities. So a a rotating furnace essentially is what a rotary kiln is. Okay. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with rotary kilns. No, it's a, it's a large uh, tube. If you could envision it in your head, imagine welding a 10 foot soup can to 100 other 10 foot soup cans, putting them in a line and the entire drum rotates about its center axis to process aggregate material from one end to the other. Okay. And then do you have like, um, like mechanisms or like corkscrews or anything on the inside to kind of push that aggregate from one end to the other? Some kilns do. It kind of depends on the product that you're processing inside of it. Some will have what they call feed spirals in the beginning of the machine that, as you can envision, it's a spiral that pushes the machine, the material downstream. Uh, Every kiln is on an inclination. 
So the natural action of gravity and the tumbling action will help that material cascade down the length. Okay, I got you. And then, Kyle, what's your kind of position and background with uh, with AC Equipment Services? Yes, uh, I started with AC 10 years ago. Um, I started out just like Jeff as, a, as an advisor, going out, measuring customers' equipment, inspecting it. Um, my title now, I'm, I'm the, the senior project manager. Um, I've, I've been with the field crew um, about nine years now. Um, started out as basically a uh, field engineer slash supervisor and then uh, moved my way up to basically the lead superintendent slash project manager. So I kind of got two roles here. My, my background, I, it's my first job out of college. I graduated um, with a degree in uh, project management, master's degree in project management, so kind of right up my alley. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about, like, the equipment you guys are, I, I guess you're, you're either servicing or installing brand new equipment into these facilities? We generally repair or replace the existing equipment in kind, or we engineer and design an upgraded solution for the customers. So what we're, our primary core business is replacing the shell of a rotary kiln. We can manufacture the shell here in Milwaukee, ship it to a cement plant or a paper mill in the regional US, and then send a team of guys that work with Kyle, primarily welders and pipe fitters and erectors, have them go out and remove a piece of the equipment and weld a new piece in. Okay, and how long does this process typically take? I mean, obviously it's gonna depend on the size of the kiln, whether it's a 10 foot Yeah, there's a lot of factors that come into play, right? But a typical uh, small kiln shell section replacement, I would say is a five to seven day job, depending on how many subcomponents are involved in the assembly. And then you guys are cutting out the exterior shell. And then, like you said, you've got like a spiral jack on the inside. They're replacing that no, as well? No, no. No, no. Well, yes, if that spiral assembly is part of the shell assembly that we're replacing, then we would fabricate that and do the sub-assembly in-house before we sent it to the field. So in the field, we're really trying to focus on the main components of the kiln, the shell, the tires, the gearing, the bases, and the drive equipment. So if we're replacing a piece of shell, maybe it has a tire section on it. It may not, which that'll drive the duration and amount of time we have to spend on the on the repair. And how often are you guys going out to facilities and, and making these types of repairs? Is this like a ongoing thing, like annual? I mean, you've got enough uh, different companies that need this service that you're pretty much busy year round. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, rotary kiln, like Kyle had mentioned, it, it should last you a hundred years. Once you have one built in an operation at your plant, it really depends on how much maintenance you do is determines or if you're going to get the full life cycle out of it or not. So knowing that there's a hundred paper mills on average across the U S maybe more easily a hundred cement plants. Couldn't tell you how many light aggregate plants are uh, iron ore pelletizing facilities, prop in manufacturing kilns. There's thousands of rotary kilns in industry. So there's plenty of business for us to be able to stay busy year round. And then are you, you all pretty much just located within the United States, the lower 48, all 50 States, or do you do international work as well? Well, the international part gets a little tricky. While AC equipment focuses primarily on customers in the lower 48, um, we do, as part of Tiss and Krupp, have service companies throughout the globe that can service projects at plants internationally. We just don't do much of it out of our office here in Milwaukee because transporting the specialized equipment we need is extremely problematic to try to take on a job in South America or even across the pond over in, you know, Asia or Europe, it, the cost is just so prohibitive. We'd never be able to be competitive with localized specialists there. I got you. So Kyle, kind of walk me through like when you guys, um, when your team gets sent out to a facility, when you, whether you're doing a, a shutdown or a paper mill, you know, how do you guys start with the demo work? Are we doing like oxy fuel cutting, oxy lance, carbon arc cutting? How are we getting this, this uh, damaged section out to be able to then replace it? Yes. So we set up a, a fixture, rotate the kiln, cut it with a oxyacetylene torch. And typically we're cutting shell steel plate that's anywhere from seven eighths up to sometimes four inches thick. So we have to typically put on a electric uh, pony motor drive to rotate this kiln slow enough to achieve cutting, especially on thicker shell. And you can imagine we probably can't rotate any more than maybe eight to 10 inches a minute when you're cutting real thick shell. Um, besides cutting with, with torches, we do do a lot of um, air arcing to remove previous welded on hardware. Uh, when we do put the new shell in and we fit the joints up, 
and seal pass it with flex core wire. We'll come back and, and use SAW sub arc welding to weld hundred percent of it from the outside. We do that the same way we do the cutting, hold the sub arc still, rotate the kiln and sub arc it at the 12 o'clock position. After the outside of it's welded, we'll go back and to the inside and air arc back gouge into the, uh, the good sub arc weld. And then we'll flex core weld the inside till we have hundred percent well oh, damn so you guys are setting up a submerged arc system on site yes that, i mean that's like that's a right. feat within itself uh well we've perfected it many years of trial and error um coming up with our own jigs uh we hang it off of our 22 ton boom crane um with a with a jib fixture and it's basically pretty rock solid unless it's extremely windy we have to sometimes tie it off but we can hold that thing steady um right on top of the kiln and drive it up there damn so when, when you guys do your flux core root pass i mean we're, we're cutting that out anyway it's a sacrificial root pass uh yeah. you said you're gouging out from the inside but when you run that flux core pass are you guys using gas shielded flux core are you using self-shielded flux core no, we typically run a 70 series dual shield flux core, okay. um, 16th diameter, run everything with, with, um, pretty much Miller wire feeders. If I could add something that you know, Kyle's leaving out a really interesting part about this process, rotary kilns are often 50, 60 feet in the air to begin with. So when he is telling you that we're attaching this welding, you know, apparatus to the jib crane, it's because we have to put that welder sometimes 80 to 100 feet in the air for someone to be able to sit on top of the kiln and operate it. Oh, yeah. So, like, here I am thinking this thing's, like, on the ground sitting up on some rollers, and you guys are just Very walking in there, you know, setting everything that's, up yeah, three when, foot off the ground. That's what the guys in our manufacturing shop, that's the luxury that they get to work under. But the field crew has the whole different dynamic of being outside in the elements and working on the kiln wherever it sits in the plant. If you get lucky, that kiln's at ground level, but 90% of the time, it's 35 <laughs> feet in the air or higher. Okay. So, so then you're on the inside of it, 100 foot up in the air, you know, back gouging out the sound weld metal and then putting another weld pass on the inside. That's correct. Now, Tip typically, it's a, it's a several-day process of fit it, uh, seal pass it, sub arc weld it, back gouge and, and weld the inside. And we typically find ourselves about half of the time getting our weld joints uh, ultrasonic tested to, to meet D1.1 standards. So now when, when you guys, because now, you know, now I'm really curious, at 85 <laughs> feet up in the air, you've got like this thing's on a slight slant. Uh, the guy on the inside of this, this kiln, are you rotating it so that he can weld it in position pretty much flat? Or does he have to go in there and kind of weld you know, 360 degrees flat horizontal vertical on the inside of this pipe. No, we, we like to work smart. So we <laughs> always roll the kiln to weld in position. It, it is so much more efficient. We'll typically roll a kiln uh, six to seven feet of weld length. And you'll do a little bit up the sides, but we don't want to get any vertical ups or horizontal welds if we can avoid it. There's just no sense. We, we have the ability to roll the kiln. Let's roll it where it's easy to work. So you just kind of clock it, you know, six foot at a time. They weld a six foot length, you know, kind of feather in their starts and stops and then rotate it another six foot and get after it you again. You got it. Exactly. Yeah, because, I mean, like, just thinking about, the, like, the small – you said 10 foot. So I'm guessing that's this, a small one. You know, yes. I mean, that's, that's 30 linear feet of weld on the inside. That's quite, oh, yeah. A, yeah, that's quite a bit. You know, you're rolling that, you're rolling that joker about five times. At least, at least. And then we, we are seeing a, um, a rise in newer kilns being installed and those are typically anywhere from 16 to 17 foot in diameter. So you can imagine 50 plus linear feet of weld is, it takes some time. Yeah. A lot of wire. Yeah, that's a lot of damn wire. You said you're using uh, 1 16th diameter flux core? Correct. Okay. No, that's that's yep. freaking awesome. Now, yeah, that's really cool. Like, it's even cooler because you're that high up in the air. So, I mean, even if, right. even if you're afraid of heights, it's not a problem anymore because you're you're inside of a can. You can't, you know. Well, there is the, the guy who has to sit on the outside of the can to do the sub arc weld. Mm-hmm. So, but he's, you know, he's up in a man lift. He's generally, he's tied off to a man lift. He's 
sitting in the basket with the weld wire and the flux pile between his feet. So he's kind of just hanging out, watching it underneath him the whole time as the kiln turns under him. I got you. And then for the flux core, or for the, the sub arc system, are you guys using like eighth inch diameter wire on that? Uh, historically we use five thirty seconds, but we're actually transitioning to three sixteenths right now. Yep. Running quite a bit. We, we run close to 800, 900 amps, uh, sometimes, but, um, Damn. Yeah, using a lot of thousand amp machines to do all our welding. Like I'm guessing a DC one thousand. Uh, yeah, we use that a lot. They also make the sub arc one thousand, which is similar to a dimension one thousand. And then you guys just pick this whole apparatus up with a crane and get it fixed just so, so the the sub arc's not kind of swaying along with the breeze, like you were saying. Correct, correct. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of setup involved, but of course we try and streamline that throughout the process. But you got to run power, you got to run ground sense leads, control, uh, one ten power, um, all that has to be run up along with the crane. So essentially, the crane's holding all your cables up as as well as run some conduit to run your electro your wire through. Damn, I'd I'd love to like just fly out and see how this operation is set up because I can't. Like I, well, I Jason, know, just, where did you say you're you're broadcasting from? Orlando, Florida. Uh, we we don't have uh, any paper mill. I mean, we got some concrete. Oh, yeah, you got facilities. a lot. Of, you have a lot of cement. There's a lot of cement plants in Florida. You yeah. just got to go to the like Lakeland area, but Brooksville. I've, okay, so I was gonna say I've done a couple of them. Like I've built structures, you know, to house them in uh, what is it, Groveland? I've did one in Orlando. I haven't been out the Lakeland area, but yeah, like I just. I can't imagine trying to fit a 10 foot diameter or 17, 18 foot diameter piece of pipe on, not on just one side, you know, setting the gap on one side, but setting it on both ends, you know, cause now um, you got to yeah, bevel it. And, and when it's on an inclination, it's, it's, exactly. there's a lot of coordination involved. There's a lot of rigging. Yes. Quite yes. A there's, a, there's a lot of rigging. That's a, I mean, besides welding, that uh, that's a big part of our job is, is, is air arc gouging, uh, cutting, running cranes, rigging onto heavy pieces of equipment. I mean, some of this stuff, you know, could be as light as 80,000 pounds. And we've done lifts over 250. As light as 40 tons. <laughs> yeah, we we talk about it. things here in big and small. And when we talk big and small, it's a big difference for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's really cool. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see, like, I got to check out YouTube now. I got to start scouring the web to watch this operation unfold before me. Cause now I'm geeking out. So I, I guess you guys are, you're looking to start hiring people to fill these positions for these field crews. Yes, we are. So we've been given a pretty aggressive goal of trying to reestablish our crew to a staff of around 32 welders. And we currently have, if, uh, Kyle knows the number better than me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say around 23 guys on the crew right now. And in order to keep up with the business volumes we're seeing, we just, we need more people. We need some, we need some quality, you know, quality skilled craftsmen, but we need some younger people coming out of college too, that are looking for a career that gets them out of a workshop into a, a new environment every day. And, you know, somebody that's looking for an adventure to be able to see different parts of the country and do something different on a daily basis. No, that's really cool. So what, what type of um, skill sets, um, you know, what's, what's like the ideal candidate look like for, a position like this, because obviously, I mean, it's multifaceted. You got to understand carbon arc gouging. You've got rigging and that's involved with it. Obviously fall protection. OSHA is going to be a big uh, consideration in this, this industry as well. Correct. So typically what I kind of equate it to is that of a millwright. Um, there is also a lot of technical work, aligning gears, aligning drives, you know, shaft alignment. So it, it's very similar to that of a millwright, but um, heavy on the, on the cutting, heavy on the welding, heavy on the rigging. And then when you, when you guys are setting this stuff up, I'm assuming you're going to bevel it, you know, cause you said you talked like the, the thinner side is like three quarters of an inch up to four inches. You guys are going to be beveling this pipe and doing multi passes. So the way we've set up our, our process and, and the way we find that it's the most efficient, but also the most accurate results is we'll bevel it with a 45 degree bevel from our shop with our new shell. And then we cut the old shell 90 straight degrees. Okay. 90 degrees. So we have a single 45 and um, you know, we've got our, our, our weld processes all certified for welding a single 45 instead of a conventional double 30 for this heavy plate. Now, when you guys are, are going in to do this, uh, do you, I'm assuming you measure it beforehand <laughs> and then your shop is going to make that, that piece in house and then ship it out to the facility. 
how many times do you have to go double, triple, and quadruple check the, the dimensions before you fire up that oxy fuel torch and cut into that beast? Well, that, that is a very important part. But, um, you know, we've got a great engineering department here that, that supports us. We've got a lot of historical information, drawings of when these kilns were manufactured and built originally. And, and, you know, we've done a lot of work with similar customers to know how much work's been done with their kiln over the last few decades, really. Um, so there's, there's a big part of it's done up front to make sure all the boxes are checked. And then when we're on site, we, we double check everything at least twice, if not three times, just to make sure that when we cut everything about the kiln that's staying is returned or improved from its, its previous operation state. Yeah. Cause at that point, I mean, if you're off an inch, you're off a mile. Well, an, it, you an know, inch it you might be, be able to live with. It's, it's when which, you're off which six inch inches. Is, it's nothing really in a, a rotary kilns. I mean, sometimes we'll see rotary kilns uh, uh, up to five, six hundred feet long. But yes, yeah, so we try and get everything well within an inch, if not less than a quarter inch. Damn, that's a, that's highly impressive. Well, you know, part of what uh, what we do as well, as Kyle had mentioned, our company is multifaceted. Not only do we manufacture this equipment, but we have a team of young engineers that goes out and they do that alignment and run out measurements on these kilns regularly. So oftentimes, if a customer's coming to us to replace a piece of kiln shell, we've already been there the year previous with, you know, our young engineers and they've mapped the entire kiln length so that we know that we have exact precise cut line locations to work off of that we can very easily verify once we're in the field. And how are you so guys? It helps take some of that mystery out of like, well, are we going to be, you know, do we need another inch of material on the end? Are we close enough? Uh, we've already figured a lot, a lot of that out well in advance of them ordering the project from us. Okay. So Kyle, when your guys, when they're going out to the field, do they have a set of prints that they're working off of, or is everything kind of laid out, you know, by the engineers, this is exactly where you need to cut. This is where you need to set everything up. This is the part that you're replacing. It's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, we, we obviously have our drawings of how we manufacture something. And sometimes we'll install stuff that maybe somebody else manufactured. We have those prints to work with. We take measurements too, to verify those prints are accurate with the new parts. And then, and then, you know, we use historical information we have about that kiln and just look at the, look at the full picture of the kiln and where it's operating. Typically we, because these kilns are hot, I mean, you know, steel grows quite extensively when you, when you heat it up to 700 degrees. I mean, we'll see kilns that'll easily run at six to 700 degree shell temperatures. So you can imagine something that's 300 feet long, you heat it up to an average temperature of 500 degrees, it might grow a foot. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that we take into consideration every time we replace shell. We, we want all of the components to line back up to their original intended, you know, there's basically foundations or piers of a kiln could aim anywhere from two to six piers of a kiln. So we need all those supports to line back up. That's another thing I was going to ask is like, because of that expansion and contraction of the material due to heat and, you know, whether it's inside or outside, I mean, it's going to grow and shrink. I mean, does, does this stuff ever get the, the kiln? Does it ever form into like an oblong shape? So, you know, kind of now you're dealing with an oval and like we built a, we built a perfect circle back here in the shop and now we got to, you know, hook it up and kind of stretch this, this, you know, 16 foot diameter piece of pipe to, to match a piece around. That, that is, is common. It's, it's not as exaggerated as you think. Um, but we'll see a lot of shell deformation in kilns and we, we, we analyze all the information we gather from a runout study to determine where a good place to cut it is, where you have maybe less than an inch of variation on the circumference of the shell. So when you are cutting into it, you can fit it up and end up with a relatively true pipe again. And that is, the, you know, the heat is probably the biggest reason we, you know, we replace shell is they're damaged um, due to losing the insulating refractory inside. They burn through kiln shell. It gets deformed. A lot of the heating and cooling cycles lead to failures in the steel, whether it's cracks from a weld or just brittleization of the steel itself. Man, that's really cool. So when, um, when you're cutting this stuff out 60, 80 feet up in the air, you know, how, exa how are you rigging that up so that once you cut it apart, you know, it's not shock loading the crane once that final cut is made and then you can get that piece out safely, especially it being on an angle. You're using like multiple cranes, multiple rigging, hook it up to pad eyes. I mean, how's that, you know, chain falls come along, is that whole nine? 
Well, well, now now you're asking for the trade secrets here. But, <laughs> this is, so I I, I, um, I did iron work for a long time. So like I'm sure. like getting weird objects into small tight spaces or or even getting them out. That's always intrigued me. Like how you know developing a lift plan. Like step one. So so it's 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 actually a little easier than you might imagine when it comes to removing it. Um, we don't obviously you know, we're rolling this kiln to cut it. So we're not cutting it a hundred percent of the way through. We're stop cutting it essentially cut 10 feet, leave three feet, cut 10 feet, leave three feet, something along that line until you make it all the way around. And we typically leave a few spots uncut, park the kiln, rig onto it. We of course, you know, have to know center gravity of that piece and the weight of it. So we get our rigging right, our crane size, right. And where to hitch it to, um, we typically will then rig onto the crane and when the crane's rigged on to the piece holding the majority of the weight, then we finish cutting it. And we cut a relief window, basically something to allow you to get it out so it's not wedged in there. Mm -hmm. And pull it out and put the new one back in. Um, typically we cut out the same amount of shell we put in, but sometimes you make an adjustment. So you might want to put in 42 feet of new shell, but you might cut out 42 foot one inch, or you might cut out 41 foot 10 inches. And so sometimes we have to use hydraulics to spread the, the kiln apart before we remove that piece. So we end up with enough gap to drop in the new one. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love hydraulics. <laughs> you can, yeah. you can move the earth with, you know, sleever bar and enough hydraulics. So are, do you guys, uh, do you sub out the crane work or do you have like in-house you know, crane operators, signalmen, rigging, um, or, you know, is that in, in, in house or is that outsourced? So as far as the crane goes, we, we don't own a crane that can do any of these lifts. We just have a 22 ton crane, very small truck mounted crane for our sub arc and other smaller miscellaneous stuff. And, and when we're renting cranes for most of this work, I mean, it's anywhere from a 200 ton crane up to sometimes a 900 ton hydraulic crane or crawler cranes in the six, 700 ton range, like a Manitowoc 18,000. Oh, um, so obviously, you know, that's um, a big piece of equipment. We work with a lot of different crane companies around the world to or around the country to supply us with cranes and operators, but we do all our own rigging. We supply all our own rigging and we are all, all, all of our guys are signif um, certified in signal person and rigging. Okay. No, that's, that's great. I mean, that's, that's something you definitely want to be proficient with when you're picking up something. And what, what are these, you said like 40 tons is kind of like the light end of what you're doing. That's, I mean, that's, that's insane. Right. A lot of the lifts are, are kind of fall in the range of a hundred to 175,000 pounds. Damn. Now we pretty so. regularly ship sections of kiln shell out of our shop that weigh over a hundred thousand pounds. So if we get a job where we're doing a kiln shell and it also has a tire mounted onto it, that's adding a substantial amount of weight now to the shell. Mm -hmm. yep. So you could, you could easily put in a piece of shell that's a hundred thousand pounds with a tire that weighs maybe 60,000 pounds. Now you got a 160,000 pound lift set. Now what's the, what's this tire doing? You said the tire is to rotate the piece. Yeah. So essentially um, you got a, a, a giant tube and there may be, let's say three supports to it. And where those three piers or foundations are, there is a tire at each of those that is basically a ring, steel ring mounted on the kiln shell. And that steel ring rides on basically carrying rollers or trunnions that are sitting on a base frame on that pier. Uh, two, two carrying rollers spread about 60 degrees apart. And that supports the whole kiln and allows it to rotate. And they're essentially giant um, bushings that uh, the shafts ride on to allow rotation and it's driven mostly by by gears large gears i mean sometimes gears that are 20 foot in diameter or bigger well you think you think jason if you got a kiln that's 10 foot in diameter the gear is going to have to be mounted to it and then larger than it in order to turn it so if mm -hmm. you got a 10 foot kiln you've got at least a 13 foot diameter gear minimum man so now for for those that aren't familiar with like cranes and everything how, how long do you, what's, what's your lead time? You say, okay, uh, you know, we got to install a crane, you know, like, I don't know, August 15th, just throwing out a date here. 
what's your lead time on getting the crane on site? Because for, for people that don't understand like how big some of these cranes are, it has to be delivered on several trucks. And a lot of times you need a crane to set up the crane. And set up six, eight hours of setup, sometimes multiple loads of counterweights. When it's a crawler crane, it's typically four to seven days ahead of when we need to use it. They're bringing it in, building the matting, building the car body, installing the boom, loading out the counterweights, testing everything. Um, but, you know, we try and rent cranes at least a month or two in advance. You know, a lot of these jobs are planned four, six, ten months in advance. And, um, these these cranes we, we typically use like on a on a straightforward shell job. The crane might come in on Tuesday, and we cut out all the shell on and remove it Tuesday, and put it all in on on Wednesday, and we're done with the crane. You know, two days. All right, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick commercial break. This segment of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Strong Hand Tools. Strong Hand Tools and Bill Pro have an awesome deal for listeners of the Arc Junkies podcast. They have nine new promo deals going on for toolkits and welding tables. They're all ten percent off with free shipping. It's a great time to clean out and update your workshop this spring. And Stronghand Tools has got your back. Head on over to stronghandtools.com backslash promo to see what kind of deals they have for you. We're also brought to you by Everlast Welders, my choice for at-home and small business welding machines. I've paid for my machines several times over with all the work I've been able to do with my Everlast 255 EXT. The 255 EXT is capable of AC and DC TIG welding with high frequency. It runs on either 110 or 220 volt. And it's super simple to set up and use. Check out the full line of Everlast machines at everlastwelders.com and use Arc Junkies in the comment section at checkout to get that free Nova foot pedal at TIG Torch when you buy any machine that comes with a stock foot pedal. Now let's get back into the show. Oh yeah, I would imagine once you get that, that root pass in there, maybe a, a couple inner passes with that sub arc, you can cut the crane free and just kind of hang out on the inside. No, actually, we just we just use hardware to, to hold the kiln shell. So once we fly that up, um, it's all being supported by our, our joint hardware on the inside. So we cut that crane free as soon as that piece is lifted up and the joint hardware is in place. Because uh, we, we, we can't turn the kiln if it's still supported by the crane. So right. we've got to join the shelf sections together and cut the crane loose so we can turn it to start welding it back together. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure like if you guys were doing like multi-rigging to the crane to where you could kind of like, we did a lot of like odd shaped lifts and stuff. So you'd have to... Um, you kind of use a come along and let, let a little bit of slack out over here and then tighten it up on the other side. So you can rotate and maneuver it. Um, I just wasn't sure. Cause it, like, like I said, I, I got to see this operation. I got to wrap my mind, I gotta wrap my mind around <laughs> this thing. This sounds really, really cool. Well, when you're, when you're dealing with this much weight and the sheer size, it's, it's, um, we found it's just best to keep it simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would imagine so. Cause it, it's, it sounds like already it's, it's a very costly operation to go out there and, and kind of replace a section of this. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah especially is, in today's market, you know, at the cost of steel having increased as much as it has, our products are you know, more expensive now than they were five years ago, but everybody's ridiculous. are. But then, you know, then you're trying to explain to your client, you're like we told you, you know, five years ago, you should have replaced it then. <laughs> now we got 300% inflation on steel. Like, I'm sure sorry. there's a lot of them right now that wish they had that crystal ball and they could go back in time and place their orders in 2017. Oh, yeah. Earlier. Get, yeah. Get 2017 prices. So, Jeff, we talked previous to the episode. Um, tell me a little about tell me a little bit about uh, what you're looking for in an ideal candidate. Because, like we we talked about earlier, you guys are actually you're hiring. You need some people in there. So, what's that? We do. What's that and process actually, look like? If you don't mind, Jason, because the, the welders all directly report to Kyle. I'm going to let him answer that question because he's got a little bit more intimate knowledge with what he's looking for. Okay. So what we're looking for, you know, is somebody who obviously is, is comfortable with the travel. That's a big thing, as you can imagine. We're all over the country um, working, you know, 160 to 170 days out of the year on the road. Uh, not continuous, of course, but on and off. Busy season is January through May. And then again uh, in the fall, September, October, November. Um, but our, our candidates, you know, who we're looking for are people that um, – you know, enjoy a, a different scene every day, like Jeff mentioned before. Uh, so, somebody who's got some experience with welding, um, and mechanically inclined, is always a good good thing to have too. Um, it's you know, like I get to a lot of people, it's not a hundred percent welding job. It's it's probably twenty five to forty percent welding, and and the rest is 
cutting and gouging and, and, and um, rigging and, and material handling. Um, you know, looking for guys who, who, um, you know, enjoy, enjoy getting down and dirty, working hard every day. I mean, we work 12 hour days, seven days a week until the job's done. We're typically on a job site anywhere from like five to 20 days, depending on the length of the job. Um, and the amount of work we got to do, we, you know, work outside all the time, which I, I enjoy it's better than sitting in, in a desk all day for me. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we got a good group of guys that all get along and, uh, you know, somebody that fits in with like-minded people that, you know, just enjoy working, um, with steel and, and, and doing this kind of work. It's every job's a little different. So you gotta, you gotta get creative and it's, it's never just repeat. And I think that that's, um, that requires somebody who's got a little bit of, um, Great you know, in the years. That, that they, they want to problem solve. Problem solving is, is a big one, you know, whether it's just trying to get the job done or problem solving equipment that goes bad. Now you mentioned working outdoors. Are you guys like extreme heat all the way into like, it's, it's snowing outside. We're still, we got to get this thing yep. swapped out. Absolutely. I mean, obviously severe weather is, is a no go. But yeah, we'll work outside when it's 30 degrees. We'll work outside when it's 90. Uh, we'll work in light rain and, and, and wind within reason. Obviously, we're not going to work in, in, in heavy lightning or, or any lightning really nearby. Um, high winds can obviously be a problem when you're working with cranes. Um, but yeah, we'll work in snow, cold, all through the night, you know. Typically, a lot of these places we go aren't in, you know, Florida. So we don't get the nice winter nights. Yeah, so. I know, because if... Had, I, had, had you guys been in Florida, I might not get into teaching. <laughs> I'm going to add a little something to, to Kyle's comments there about what we look for in a good candidate. And thank you, Kyle, for those comments. I appreciate it. Um, I, you know, for me, I've always equated it to you're looking for the guy who enjoys fixing his car on the weekends or really enjoys kind of tearing his lawnmower apart and fixing it himself. The guy with some natural mechanical aptitude. This is what you need. You know, like Kyle said, someone who wants to work with their hands, they enjoy the satisfaction that comes with building something, you know, from the ground up and, and is willing to, to travel. The traveling part is a big aspect of this job that it just can't be overlooked. Yeah. Travel is a huge part. Like a lot of people it are is. like, you know, I want to get out there and I want to make all this money, but I want the job 15, 20 minutes from my house. But yeah. You got to sacrifice. Yeah, to unless you want to move next to the job site every, you know, 20 days, you're not going to be close to work. Right. But you brought up a good, a good point. If I could just parlay that into a few other comments, um, you know, the traveling aspect of the job, while it's a big portion of it, we do a really good job of compensating our employees well for that aspect. You know, we don't require anybody to share a hotel room with a guy on day shift or night shift. You know, there's a lot of companies that'll try to save money and they'll have guys share rooms or they'll cram six guys into a rental car have them drive to from California to you know, the other side of the country. We're not going to do that. We'll fly everybody to the job site as long as the job site's, you know, within reason of a reasonable distance that you need to fly to. Everybody gets their own hotel room. The compensation package is very robust. We have great PTO uh, allotment. We 401k plan, all the natural, you know, compensation things that most companies offer. But when you're on the road, we take pretty good care of you. The per diem rate is really is is on par with the industry average. Um, the hotel accommodations are great. We we'll take care of all the rental cars. All the expenses are covered. So when when you guys that while the guys have to make a sacrifice to be out on the road, I think we do a really good job of making sure that that time spent is is under good conditions that they want to come back and work under. Yeah, that's that's kind of ideal. I've I've had to share a room with several other dudes, and it's like, man, I work with you all day. The last thing I do I want to do is like see your face right before I go to bed. And the first thing when I get out of bed in the morning, I know there's companies that have to have a night shift guy and a day shift guy share the same room in the same bed. That's so nasty. you're sleeping in the bed after the night shift guy left in the morning. Like no way am I crawling into that bed. Yeah. That's why I was glad that I joined the Marines and not the Navy. Cause I couldn't imagine like, <laughs> hot racking with another dude and be like, no man, I don't need you to warm that up for me before I get into, <laughs> before I go to bed. Oh. <laughs> So now do you guys, uh, what are you looking for as, as far as like the, the welding aspect of it? Does it help if they have, if they're certified in a given process and a given position, pipe, plate, whatever, uh, does that weigh, you know, to a benefit, uh, for the company or not? Because they already have, 
they show proficiency with, you know, that process? So I guess the, the easiest way to explain it is um, we don't really require anybody to have certification in any particular process coming in the door. Um, somebody who's got experience in flux core welding that can stack a nice three quarter, one inch fillet weld. That's a big plus. Um, that, that, that requires some skill and some, some, some practice. Um, and one root pass in one, you know, one quarter inch fillet weld or something is, is substantially easier than a, a one inch fillet weld. Um, somebody with, with some air arc gouging experience is also a plus, um, you know, the sub arc welding, it's, it, it's probably more on site learning than anything, just because of the nature of how we do it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you understand flux core welding and sub arc welding is going to come a little more natural. Um, just a matter of seeing how we do it, how we set it up, how troubleshooting it, all that. So ideally, you know, candidates that have gouging and, and, and welding experience on, on big gauge wire. I'm, I'm glad you guys place an emphasis on gouging because I still teach gouging in my program and I, I go to like different conferences and stuff. And we, you know, we talk about what we teach our students. They're like, why are you teaching gouging? Like, why, why are you going through art gouging? That's such an archaic process. And it's like, it's pretty used in the industry. Like, I mean, it's, it's well used in the industry. You've got to cut like the backside of something out. Or if you, if you mess something up, you know, you're not going to take a a grinding wheel to a, you know, like you said, a three quarter inch fillet weld. You're not taking a hard rock to that. You're going to cut it out with a carbon arc gouging rod. Well, you spent, you spend a couple hours running a nine inch grinder with a hard wheel. You realize the gouging is worth it. But yeah. That's, that's where the money's at right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and you're right. There is a lot of gouging involved in our process. You know, when we join those, that new shell to the old shell and Kyle had mentioned, we use a lot of hardware in order to bring those sections together. Well, the hardware ex- consists of some angles that are welded to the inside of the shell and some other blocks that are welded. All of that material has to be gouged off before we leave the job site. We can't leave it in there that way because mm-hmm. the whole tube is going to get lined with refractory brick afterwards. So if you're not good at gouging, you're going to spend a hell of a lot of time uh, grinding the rest of that bayonet black down because you didn't skim cut it close enough to the shell. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather be on a carbon arc gouge than grinding any day of the week. Oh, me too. Hands down. So now, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, Jeff, you had mentioned you talked about some of the the benefits as far as traveling on the road and compensation and stuff. I mean, what, what could somebody expect, uh, you know, going through the hiring process, getting selected to go out on this work? What are you typically starting your average welders off at like an hourly wage? Well, uh, if you come in, if you're coming in with some level of experience and maybe even have a little past experience in the industry, you're probably, and Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but you should be starting around the $30 an hour range. That's Um, correct. As far as our you know, compensation package goes, again, we, you know, we offer five weeks of PTO to every employee that starts. You can earn up to six weeks after 10 years. Um, now, I should mention that you don't get five weeks of PTO on day one. You have to earn it throughout the year. So if you worked an entire year and never took a day off, by the end of that year, you'd have 25 days of PTO. Damn, that's not, that's not bad at all. No, for somebody who's yeah. either coming from a when job or maybe you maxed out at three or you're just fresh out of school and you've never had PTO and one year in, you got 25 days. Yeah. I'm going on uh, seven years right now with my current employer. And I think I still get, I'm lucky enough to get two weeks every year. Okay. Yeah. And that's how it was when I started. Now compensation's changed over 22 years. So I've got a much more, a more robust program that we can offer. Right. But again, on top of that, it's uh, we do things like steel toed boots. Everybody knows how expensive steel toed boots are. We'll pay for one pair of boots every single year up to three hundred dollars for that pair of boots. Oh, so you can get some nice kicks. Oh yeah, you're not you're not going to you're you not, know you're not Sears and buying Wolverines the cheap over at, at the Walmart. Yeah, exactly right. No, you're going to Red Wings and you're getting yourself some nice boots. There we go. But you know we do other things along along that same line. All the PPE is provided for. Um, even if you're someone who you know if you need glasses and you need safety glasses that are you know, prescription as well. We'll cover a pair of those every single year for you. Um, again, the per diem is very robust. And since we're covering all of your travel expenses, the per diem is pretty much your food allotment for the day. And it's, yeah, it's straight cash. So like, I like to tell a lot of guys, you know, $30 an hour, but you add in the per diem, you're adding four fifty five bucks an hour to your um, 12 hour day. 
Yeah, that's not bad at all. And we do pay, you know, overtime as well. So uh, the welders are all hourly employees, so they get straight time for the first eight and time and a half for the second four of every day, Monday through Friday, and then straight time and a half Saturday and Sunday. And as Kyle mentioned, we're working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. So you're working an 88 hour week. You got 48 hours overtime each week. So now like you'd mentioned like based on experience or depending on experience, how open is AC equipment services to hiring folks like directly from a vocational school or trade school or like a specific welding school? That's actually one of the things we we're trying to actively market. It can be difficult sometimes to break into those schools. A lot of the universities now that offer welding want to do their recruiting through this handshake platform. And that's great, but it isn't the same as getting in front of a classroom of candidates that are getting ready to graduate and promote the company. So no, it is, it's, it's an avenue we definitely want to explore. Yeah, uh, you you hire younger employees, you get a lot more longevity out of them, mm-hmm. you know. And and sometimes, not to say that experience doesn't weigh heavily on people's factors, but sometimes experience breeds some bad habits from the last job as well. Yeah, where you got guys coming in fresh from school, they don't have any bad habits built into them yet. The, well, they may have a few well, from college, yeah. but they don't have the bad work ethic habits that you could have to break before you train them on the new things. Right, and that's that's one of the things I try to preach to all the students that go through my program is I'm going to teach you the right way to do things. You can learn your bad habits when you get into industry. So if you 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 grab somebody fresh out of the, you know, fresh out of a good program, they don't have the bad habits. The only way they know how to do it is to do it right. You know, so they're they're going to be over there grinding off the mill scale to make sure they put in a good weld. And the the employer is going to have to be the one to tell them, we don't have time for that. Just, just burn it in. You know, we'll we'll, we'll burn it out on the next pass. That that's a bad habit. You can learn that once you get in industry and you're working for somebody else and they're paying you to do it, do it how they want you to do it. Because at the end of the day, they're the one paying you the paycheck, right? Yeah. And you know, people, candidates, you know, coming fresh out of a welding program, you know, that those people are passionate about welding. You know, it's not just another job. They're seeking this profession because that's what they've trained to do. Mm -hmm. So they're coming in already with that right. Aggressive attitude. They want to prove themselves early on. Uh, They just, you know, candidates fresh out of the welding schools bring a lot of, freshness to the position. I'm, I'm glad you see that. I've, I've beat my head against the wall trying to talk to like some of the local employers and they're like, yeah, we only want to hire them if they've got five to seven years worth of work experience. Well, how are you going to get to five to seven years of work exactly. experience if you never give an entry level guy a, an opportunity? Exactly. But then I, I kind of like throw back at him like you want somebody five to seven years, you know, worth of experience, but you're willing, you're, you're only willing to pay entry level pay. You're not going to get the candidate you're looking for, for that price. Right. So, I mean, like open up your doors, bring somebody in that's, that's young and eager and wants to do this and train them and treat them right. And they're, they're going to stick around. They're going to stay. They're going to have longevity with that company. Yes. And that's definitely what we're looking for. I want to kind of go back to the history of AC just really quick, because um, sure. a lot of people don't understand, like we could only because we were just talking about longevity. AC started off as, well, Jeff, I'll let you tell the story because I, I thought okay. it was pretty cool when I, when I talked to you last week on the phone. Yeah. So AC equipment is a company that was started by a group of engineers that were former employees of the Alice Chalmers corporation. And that's where the A and the C come from. And Alice Chalmers here in Wisconsin at one point in time was the largest employer in the state. You know, our business is located in West Alice, Wisconsin, and that Alice comes from the Alice Chalmers corporation. So it was, it was the biggest employer. Matter of fact, we still work in the original Alice Chalmers complex now. And so our office building is the original manufacturing plant from Alice Chalmers. So we still have P&H cranes hanging in some bays that they've created as a decorative you know, element for people to see when they walk by. Some of us still know what those things were used for. Other people just see a pretty yellow crane and think, oh, that looks nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But yeah, AC equipment then started in the 90s. This group of engineers found a, a niche service industry that Alice Chalmers was no longer looking to explore for opportunities. And they were able to acquire all of the equipment they needed to start a manufacturing plant. And they it started as a service-based company. Matter of fact, our first customer called in the 90s, their kiln shell had cracked completely in half. And they didn't know who to call other than AC equipment because our name was all over their kiln. It says Alice Chalmers on all their bearing housing. So they called us and said, Hey, is there any way that you guys could come and help us fix this kiln? And this was before we had a manufacturing shop. So at the time we found a shop, uh, I believe out in Salt Lake city, they rolled a piece of shell for us, shipped it over to this plant. 
in South Dakota, we found eight or 10 guys that were willing to jump in a pickup truck or two, take some welding equipment out there. And we welded in a piece of kiln shell. And that was how AC equipment started. That's pretty impressive. And then created a business model like around that. So from building tractors to doing kiln shells. Yeah. So Alice Chalmers, I should go back for a brief moment. Well, many people know them as the company that built those bright orange tractors here in the Midwest. Alice Chalmers also manufactured a lot of other equipment and rotary kilns was one of their primary businesses. You know, if you go out into the industry today, there's really only seven or eight OEMs for rotary kilns. And Alice Chalmers was one, was a big name mm-hmm. in the day. So that name recognition from the AC certainly helps for us these days that a lot of people think of AC as Alice Chalmers and we were able to generate a lot of business from it. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Like the history, the progression of the company and everything. And, you know, like, like we were talking about longevity, you know, it's not like you're going to work for a company that's, they've, you know, they've only been around for 20 years and they might shut their doors down during, like we just seen during COVID, like a lot of companies just folded up overnight and like, boom, they're gone. You know, they're, yeah, we are, we're history. fortunate. We were fortunate. Our industry wasn't as negatively impacted by COVID as a lot of others. Matter of fact, we probably saw the biggest level of growth during COVID we've seen in 15 years. I could see that because I mean that that made you know like a lot of highways got repaired during COVID. You know a lot of a lot of the maintenance and repair that we just uh, we just don't have time to do it got taken care of during COVID. You know so a lot of people got caught back up because they couldn't push out products or anything like that. So I mean like construction was still booming during you know the lockdowns. Everybody was considered. Yeah, it doesn't essential. seem to be slowing down either right now. Yeah, but to to go back to your comment about longevity. Um, to give you an example of some of the longevity, even currently in our company, as I mentioned, I've been employed here for 22 years. And like Kyle, this is the first job I had after college. And, you know, most people don't stay with a company for 22 years unless the benefits and the company culture is a place you want to be at that long. Mm-hmm. And I'll say the, it's, it's the reason I'm still here. And it's the reason I hope that someday I can say that I, I only worked at AC equipment my entire career. Yeah, that, that's one of the biggest things. Like my grandfather, he worked for Manfredi Trucking Company from the age of like, he started like young. I mean, he was born during like way back in the day. I can't, I can't even remember the years, but he started out truck driving, like long distance truck driving at age 16 before you needed a CDL. Like CDL wasn't sure. even a thing. He retired at age 65 from that same company and then worked probably another five to seven years as a dispatcher locally and or, um, remotely in Florida. So, but he only ever worked for one company his entire life. But now you see a lot of, you know, you look at people's like LinkedIn and it's like 30 job listings. It's like, okay, they, they bounce around a lot, but it, is it the employee's fault? Is it the company's fault? Is it a mix of the two? I mean, you don't really find a whole lot of people that, you know, go into a company and that's like their first job, like right out of school, right out of college. And then they end up retiring with that company. You don't see that a lot anymore. No, it doesn't happen a whole lot anymore. And this is, you know, I grew up in the generation uh, graduating high school in the mid nineties. And it seemed like everybody that I went to college with, as we were getting ready to graduate, say, Hey, you know, I I touch base with them five years later and they're on to their third career. Mm -hmm. And, and say, you never know what it is. Is it the company? Is it the person you don't know? And you don't want to ask, but I know one thing after 22 years at AC, you only stay at a company that long if you're treated well and you believe in the company's mission. Right. So now what do you guys have opportunities for growth? So let's say somebody comes in as a welder because we're on the subject of longevity. You come in for a welder. Nobody wants to be a welder in that type of environment for 22, 25 years. Is there other opportunities for them to pursue while they're within the company? There are, um, you know, welding is probably one of those that the, the branches of your career path are not as robust as some of the other positions we have here, but we, I worked, you know, again, I've been here a long time. So some of the guys who now are supervisors for Kyle's repair crew were welders when I started with them 22 years ago. So there is some managerial hierarchy within that crew. Um, And again, if you worked in that environment for 15 or 20 years, you've likely gotten yourself to a level of skills where you may be able to, at some point, become a superintendent like Kyle and actually manage the entire job site. While you may be missing some of that technical acumen that an engineer might need, as far as aligning a gear or something, we have so much support here in the office, we can really make anybody's successful if they've got the right skill sets out in the field. So yeah, there is, there is a progression from welder kind of, you know, ground guy to welder to supervisor to superintendent. And, you know, depending on your personality, maybe 
when you're done welding, yeah, you know, welders have are pretty personal people, right? Most of them have uh, the ability to to talk for quite a bit of time. Maybe you'd make a good salesman. We're never going to let someone with good talents leave the company if we can find another avenue for them to pursue here that keeps them happy and and willing to stay with us. Very nice. So what's what's the employment process look like as far as like submit an application or like how's that whole process work? Yeah, like most companies now, you know, a lot of us have transitioned that all over to some type of online platform. So ThyssenKrupp has a website that they maintain. You go you go to the website to find the job open job postings on their site. The welding position for AC equipment is listed there. You use that link to apply for the job, submit your resume. HR will then funnel that information over to myself and Kyle. We pretty weekly get a stack of resumes to review. We weed through the candidates, find what we like about a couple of them, and you know we reach out to them, set up an interview. Depending on where they're regionally located, maybe we have them come and visit our shop here in Milwaukee. A lot of times we get a lot of candidates from other parts of the country, so we'll conduct our interviews by teams. And if we get a good feel for you, we have HR reach out to you and make you an offer and hope that you'll join our crew. Awesome. And then what's that, what's the onboarding process look like? Cause I remember when we talked earlier, you said that you, you guys have uh, once, once you do get on, you have some uh, like a time frame for training and stuff that you'll go through up in. Uh, yeah, Kyle, in I'm going to let Kyle speak to that. Cause he's a little bit more familiar with the welder onboarding process. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, typically give somebody an opportunity to um, transition to a new job, you know, hire them maybe three, four weeks out, whatever it takes, you know, based on your situation. We'll have you come to Milwaukee that first week, at least for a week, maybe for two. Uh, there's some, you know, HR stuff, that kind of thing I do on the first day, introductory. Uh, we have everybody get Amshaw trained. If you already have it, it's an eight-hour class. If you don't, it's about 30 hours. So that takes a good chunk of your week. We also do OSHA training. Everybody gets that. Um, and then another thing that we have them do when they're here is take a two weld tests, um, have them per- pass a, a, a vertical up and a horizontal and um, give some guys some time to practice, a couple of test plates, do your weld, 100% penetration. So weld one side with a, uh, a single bevel, 45, like we mentioned earlier, flip it over, back algae it in that same position, and then weld it back again in that same position. And then we send it out for x-ray. And if you pass, there you go. You're, you're good to go in welding. Um, if you don't pass, we, we want you to, to pass before you start welding on the com- customer's equipment. So we don't, you know, we're not going to have you weld, but we want to see you pass it. So we'll give you some, some time to practice and, and take that test again. And we have a couple of guys in our shop that can, you know, help, teach you the ins and outs, the tricks of, of the equipment and give you some pointers. Uh, besides the weld test, we'll let people take a tour of our manufacturing shop, kind of see what the equipment is, get them familiarized with the lingo and the, and the, the you know, what we call everything. Uh, just so you, when you arrive on a job site, you have a little bit of idea of what we do. It's really kind of hard to do all that training here. Um, most of that training is on the job just because of this equipment isn't something we just have in our shop. It's too big to have our own kiln to, to show people what to do. Yeah. So, it's not like you got a lion around in the back corner there. Exactly. So uh, we, we try and educate people um, with, you know, the tools and the equipment we have in our shop, show them how it works, what it does, what it's called. And um, have you come out on the job site and, a lot of on the job training. Don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, and, and we like to see guys that you, you show up, just get involved. You don't have to know what you're doing, but be there, be present, ready to work. Now we do also have a certified welding inspector on our staff. He primarily works in our manufacturing facility, but he's a great resource for any new employee who's struggling with their welding to begin. You know, he's, he can come out and help give those guys some pointers. We also have a gentleman that works for Kyle in our shipping and receiving location who used to be a welder on the crew. And so he's the one that kind of helps facilitate the weld tests. And since he is a certified welder as well, you know, he can give those guys some additional help and training throughout that week so that we can get them to the point where they do pass that test before they leave here and they're ready to strike an arc when they get to the field. Okay. And then are you guys also hiring for your manufacturing facility? Because I guess if you have an in-house CWI, you've got some people doing some welding at the facility. 
Uh, I'm not sure if they currently have any positions open. They had one position open about a month ago, but I, I believe that they recently filled that. Okay. And then just, just because I know I'm going to get the question probably after the fact, and then like, I have a lot of female students. Do you guys have uh, females in the field and are you open to hiring females for those field positions? Uh, I'm not, I don't believe we currently have any female welders, but we have no opposition to hiring any female welders. It just historically has not been a position that drew a lot of female candidates. Okay. I'm going to catch a lot of flack for this, but like a lot of the female students that go through the different welding programs and I've spoke with several other welding instructors, like the females seem to do a lot better when it comes to welding, but you know, it is a field position. So a lot of, a lot of females end up in manufacturing, but there are some, you know, that do want to travel. They want to get out there and like kind of do that type of work. Yeah. Again, we would, we would have no reason to object to any candidate that is willing to travel and is, is a good welder, awesome. man, woman, that doesn't matter. Lion bear. Hey, if you can weld, come on over. There you go. Okay. Uh, do you guys have anything else before we close out? Is there any contact information you want to throw out there? Uh, the best way to apply for that position? I, I know you said, well, yeah, uh, as website. I mentioned there, there is a website that you can use, but the probably the best place to place to start is give us a call here in Milwaukee. You can call us at 414-475-2554. Speak to our administrative assistant, Donna Wellner, and she's a great resource. She's going to put any candidate in the right position to find that application website or answer any general questions about the company. Fantastic. If you, if you, if you're tech savvy, you want to go on the computer, check it out. Um, easiest thing I do is probably just search uh, Tiss and Krupp jobs in Milwaukee and the position that is our, our, our field mechanic slash welder position for the Milwaukee location is the one that you would apply for electronically. Awesome. Jeff, Kyle, it's been a pleasure having you guys on the podcast. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about this whole, this is a whole new industry for me when it comes to, you know, like swapping out components on a kiln and, you know, making those shell replacements. Like I said, if, I'd, I'd love to get a chance to come check this out and see it in real time. Um, hopefully that'll happen one day, but definitely thank you for coming out, sharing the information with the, uh, the listeners of the Arc Junkies podcast and then providing a job opportunity for them as well. Well, thank you as well, Jason. We really appreciate you giving both Kyle and I some time to promote our company, talk a little bit about what we do. And I promise you, we're going to have a job site in Florida. So when we do, we're going to call you up and invite you out there to take a look at it so you can see this work. Yeah, hit me up. I'm, I'm 45 minutes outside of Lakeland, so I've got no problem running out oh, there real perfect. quick. Oh, perfect. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you giving this opportunity to promote AC in our open welding positions. Oh, anytime. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast. If you're interested in working with AC Equipment Services, I'll put the link and the phone numbers in the show notes section of the episode so you can find it a little bit easier. Don't forget to tune in this Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the AWS Instagram for a special Instagram Live version of Weld Wednesdays with AWS, hosted by yours truly. I'll be chatting with the one and only Ray Ripple. And don't forget to tune in tomorrow for an all-new episode of Just the Tip Tuesday. Y'all have a great week, stay safe out there, and until next time, make every well better than your last.